great. OK, so in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the October 20th meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's budget committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through a Microsoft Teams live event. Links can be found on the BCPS website and on board docs. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Bean if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Bean, would you please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee? Yes, Ms. Head. Present. Ms. Jose. Ms. Mack. Ms. Mack. Sorry, I'm here. Okay. Mr. McMillian. Yes. Ms. Pasture. Yes. I would also like to acknowledge the following staff members that are participating today. Ms. Dr. Brian Scriven. Mr. George Saris. Mr. Witt Tantleff. Present. And if there are no additional staff participating that were mentioned, please state your name and I don't believe we have any, so we're good to go. Thank you. Mr. Tantleff will now provide a presentation of the fiscal year 2023 budget process and calendar, as well as a review of the effect of unspent school and or office funds from prior years on budgeting. Hi, thank you. Let Good me, afternoon. Thank you. Uh, um, so I uh, combined both the agenda items are kind of covered in this presentation. Um, OK. Oops, uh, hold on, let me just get in pre. What do you guys see right now? We see your slides. Um, they are in outline form. Yeah, let me try to. Oh, there we go. OK, there we go. All right, uh, so uh, the question came up last meeting. Let's, you know, to kind of go through how the budget process works at BCPS. And then also uh, Mr. McMillian had asked about well, what happens with unspent funds at the end of the year? Does that penalize their budget the next year, both in offices and schools? So I'll try to address that. Um, a number of these slides were taken from the presentation we give to the budget managers. Uh, because I thought it was appropriate for this audience. Um, so some of the some of them may address, you know, the audience in that way. Um, let's see what's well, not moving. Let's try this. There we go. OK, so here are kind of the, the key dates now. We can, uh, if you all would like at some point, we we have a very, very detailed calendar that, that shows every single meeting that takes place. But this is kind of high level if you're just trying to follow the cycle, how it works. Um, so in mid-September, um, well, actually first, we don't have it on here, but we meet with all the budget managers. So in other words, basically every, every office that has a budget, we'll meet with them to kind of set things up uh, give them a little background on what's going on with the state, what do we think might happen with the county, and just kind of get everyone in the right mindset. We also do a high level performance budget training and performance budgeting is a system. It's part of Advantage Financial, but it's its own module that we do budgeting in. 
Um, and then in mid-September, we have four or five hands-on meetings. Uh, they're optional, so managers can come with their uh, fiscal assistants and they can uh, see exactly how to use the module. We'll give them as much help as they want and they can put their whole budget in the system if they choose to during that um, meeting. Then everything's due September 30th. Then, Mr. Tantliff, can I yeah. jump in with a question? So would you sure. consider Ms. Mack? Yes. You may have the floor. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tantliff, would you consider Dr. McComas the budget manager for curriculum or an instruction or is there somebody within her department that handles this? Yeah, it would be each of her managers. So there's probably, you know, a dozen budgets that go in for CNI that she eventually, they bubble up to her and she approves them and then we'll meet with her to help uh, develop the final recommendations for the superintendent. And it, that would be true then for other departments that yeah. they could have multiple people that bubble up to the department head? Y yeah, so for instance, for, uh, for Dr. Scriven, um, he would have, uh, Jim Corns would have IT, but within Jim's department, he would have three or four people do their own budgets. They bubble up to him, then he approves the budgets. He might have some back and forth, and then he sends them on to Dr. Scriven. And so each of the chiefs has that process. You know, they'll give some direction after our kickoff meeting on what they're looking for. Um, but each of the uh, managers will put in what they believe are, um, well, they'll do two things. First, they take their existing dollars and put them into a logical budget based on how they think they'll spend the money next year. And then probably the key thing, though, is they'll put in any new initiatives for their chief to review. Um, and then we also, they'll work on built-ins, which just as a reminder, a built-in is basically our contractual expense that, that, that we're obligated to have inflation for. It'll be fuel costs if we expect those to rise or go down in the next year, non-public placement. So we have a lot of things called uh, built-ins which we do present and review with the board, but they got get a lot less attention generally than what we call an A4, which is the, is the form we use for new initiatives. That's mostly what the board focuses on. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt. No, no interruption right. and feel free to stop whenever you have a question. This is, you know, just very informal. Thank you, Ms. Um, Mack. And Mr. Tantliff, I have a follow-up question yes. to, to Ms. Mack's question. So mm -hmm. that that's very helpful. Um, the process then begins with existing dollars and roughly would you say 80% of those are salaries or existing dollars? I know a, a majority of that would be. Well, um, well, about 85% of our budget is salaries, 85. but mm -hmm. But the offices don't budget their, they don't have to do they anything don't. with their salaries. Okay. Because we, we, uh, it's, it might hit their budget, but they don't have to do anything with them because there's nothing they can do about them. So in other words, if they had a vacancy, they don't have to worry about the salary of who they hire. We kind of take care of all of that centrally. So it's really their non-salary dollars that they're, um, Looking thinking at. about other than new positions, a new position would certainly be relevant, but their existing staff with the existing positions, if they don't want any changes, uh, that won't even get a discussion normally. Okay, thank you. And the, the performance budgeting module, when they begin this process, do they start with <clears throat> the prior year's dollars built in for them and it, it may seem like I'm getting into the weeds but there's a method to the madness behind the question whereas that's those built-ins I believe you called them I know yeah, we don't so, use a zero-based budgeting mo um, model or approach to this but is that something that's looked at based on last year's um, well uh, yes yeah, so there's their non-built-in budget they'll see they'll see their budget from the prior year 
and they'll see their expenditures from two years ago and then they'll have a target um, to rearrange their budget and hit that target and generally if nothing out of the ordinary is going on their target will be the same budget they had the prior year so for fy23 their starting point is going to be the same as fy22 now uh, you'll recall this wasn't really this is really post budget but you know when dr williams had to cut 10 million dollars in fy21 to hit the one percent cola that came out of everyone's budget but that was after they had already put their budgets together but if for instance we knew that going in then we would have reduced their targets by the to however much we wanted them to go after uh instead we went after certain buckets and certain positions Okay, so if the board were to say set a target for particular departments, that's something that the advantage system could be set to have a defined target, let's say, and this exercise could be um, set with that goal in mind. Uh, yes, P I mean, PB, you can think of, uh, just in, in your mind, you can think of it as a dumb capture tool. I mean, it's actually got a lot of sophisticated features, but as far as the user goes, he, they see their budget and they see their target and by line item they can put in how many dollars they want with notes. Mm -hmm. Then um, for built-ins they need to uh, justify what they're asking for. So if their built-ins are going up in costs like electricity, they'll give an, an elaborate build-up to what they think their electrical costs will be the next year or their sewage costs based on usage, based on projected costs, et cetera. And, you know, there's some variation on uh, how much detail gets input for the built-ins, but we'll go back to them during the next set of meetings I'll describe. And especially if it's something that's changing and if it's going up significantly, we'll really want a lot of backup so that we're comfortable that that number makes sense. Um, we don't, you know, want people to put in too much money or too, li too little money. We want it to be you know, as accurate within reason as possible. So overall, you expect the expenditures to be the same from year to year, unless there's a backup that justification that's provided explaining the increase. And that's something that your office looks at on a line yeah. item basis when it's submitted. Yes. Now, again, if we go back to their baseline budget, that will be the same as the, the prior year. The built-ins we normally expect to be inflated because they're just always is built-in inflation, though we may have offsets in places. <clears throat> That's where they'll need to put the justification in. Okay. For the built-ins and then anything new. So if they think they're going to need new things in their budget, then that uh, is a separate, it's a tab in the module. But so there's a baseline budget that's basically flat to prior year. There's the built-in budget, and many offices have no built-ins. We have to agree, George and I have to agree, this is a built-in. And so they, they might change slightly from year to year. Someone might come up with something that really makes sense to be a built-in, and it wasn't in the past. And again, by making it a built-in, the dollars would move out of their regular budget, but it's because we agree that they really can't control how much the cost is going up or down. And, and it can go down to stuff like energy. So we don't want them to be able to reuse those savings either. We want that all to be captured centrally. So those are really the three things they're looking at. New initiatives, um, the built-ins, and their baseline budget. And for instance, last year, there were almost no new initiatives because we just didn't know what was going to happen because of the pandemic in terms of our revenue expectations. So mm -hmm. the only thing Dr. Williams ended up asking for really last year was compensation related items. Um, thank, thank you, sure. that's very helpful. Uh, and then the grants are done the same way on a different timeline, on a slightly different process, but the grants are each, you know, because it's not really by office, it's by grant. So uh, one of my senior analysts manages the grant budget process and works with each of the grant managers to get what they believe the most accurate depiction of the grants will be. <clears throat> but as you know, grants change over time um, and we get sometimes last year, you know, we, we got all the ESSER 
funds in and we needed to do an amendment for that. That was extraordinary. Um, but just grants in general, until they're awarded, it's practically impossible to know exactly how much they're going to be. So um, in any case, that's done in parallel on a slightly different timeline than general funds. Um, I think many of you are involved with the area advisory councils. And then <clears throat> something we just uh, talked about, the budget reviews for each department. What we're really talking about there is the chiefs. <clears throat> so we've already met, um, like we've met with Mary twice because you know she has such a large department, so we had to split it up. So uh, we met with Brian twice, same thing. Um, we are meeting uh, with say, with Mike Zarchin tomorrow. We met with HR. So um, and some of the smaller groups we don't have to meet with. We'll just exchange questions, but we'll have back and forth with the chiefs. So that'll help them. Hey, they've probably looked at everything submitted but they may not have really scrutinized it just depending on the initiative um, and what it is and, and the timing and everything. So we go through every line item that's been submitted. So every new thing that's been submitted and every built-in that's been submitted. And we um, will go through each line item. So, the chief, so we have someone from uh, the chief staff talk about it. It could be the chief, it could be one of their direct reports and they can bring anyone they want to to the meeting. They can have BDs, they can have some directors. Um, the offices that have fiscal assistance like CNI and transportation, the fiscal assistance will come or Diane Hegberg who works for Pete Dixit, she'll uh, certainly come as well as some of his direct reports. So whoever can speak to it the best, it's, it's, it's informal. We're going through it, but um, Kelly Wynn who's on my staff, um, George when he can attend, we'll just ask questions just to make sure everyone understands what's being asked for. And then uh, the result of the process is the chief will decide what do they want to present to the superintendent. So it's based on what we're hearing at the meeting because it might we might all agree once we push back on it doesn't really make sense. This isn't going to fly. This there's not enough money this year. And also you know feedback they're getting from their one on ones with. Um, Dr. Williams, what they're hearing, <clears throat> you know, if there's board discussions, if the public's commenting. So they're taking all that into account <clears throat> and deciding what they'd like to present to Dr. Williams. Um, so those meetings will be done this week, um, maybe one or two follow ups next week. And then the first week in November, we'll start meeting with Dr. Williams. Um, there's four meetings if they all go forward. It's basically with the chiefs, Dr. Williams, me, um, Kelly, who I mentioned on my staff, George, of course, um, and we'll kind of go through what do we think revenue might look like. The chiefs will present their initiatives they'd like Dr. Williams to consider. He's taken into account his interactions with the board, the CE, a lot of different things. Um, and then over a, about three weeks, we'll hopefully finished by Thanksgiving, if not the week after, he'll uh, be aligned on what he'd like to present to the board in terms of initiatives. And then over the next few weeks leading up till Christmas, he'll put you know, his presentation together. And then of course on January 11th, uh, you guys will receive Dr. Williams PowerPoint then it's not listed on here. Of course, there's multiple work sessions, lots of board questions back and forth. Um, the board is scheduled to vote February 22nd. Then the CE will present his budget in April. County Council votes in May. And then July 1st, money is available. Ms. Ms. Han, I have a couple questions. Yes, Mr. McMillian. Uh, wait, who actually prepares the Board of Education budget and does it fall under this the same kind of time frame? Yes, it does. So Tracy will really pull it together. Um, it's going to be flat to the prior year because it's really just your baseline budget unless 
because really the stuff the board well it's not really for the board's budget i was just i was conflating two things because most of the items the board is asking for is not in the board's budget it's you know under the board of education for whatever uh, areas they want to put money into so um if you all wanted to you could have uh tracy have a small session with you your budget's relatively small um and, uh, you know, if the money's not in the right place exactly, it's all under the same what we call appropriation. So the money can be spent under that appropriation um, without any system constraints. So the object might be different, but the activity would be the same. Uh, but Tracy will, uh, I don't know exactly what her process uh, will be with you guys, but it's Again, it's a fairly small budget and she would be submitting it. OK, how about the audit department? How do they consider? My inter technically, they're under our umbrella and they're not in the BCPS organizational chart under Dr. Williams. So where yeah. do they, how do they fall in? And I, I'm assuming Andrea Barr constructs their yeah, budget. She does. Who, and who does she report to? Well, I, Andrea reports to to the board, but uh, as far as submitting the budget, she's the, um, you know, she would look like the chief for her budget. So she would present it through the channels going to Dr. Or does she go straight to Dr. Williams? Well, she she wouldn't present to Dr. Williams because her budget's very small. Um, so if, uh, let's say she needed something though that was significant or a couple of staff members or something like that, then either um, we maybe she would come in and make that presentation. But since she's not normally considered part of his cabinet, she would not uh, normally attend the meetings. And if her budget comes in flat to the prior year, so she generally just has a baseline budget. We're just going to accept whatever she presents. If she has something new she's requesting, then we'll address it with the superintendent in whatever way makes sense. OK, and my last question, it just appears to me that the area advisory councils, they kind of feel left out and and you, you if that's a reoccurring thing theme. It appears to me that people don't listen to them and and they come up with recommendations and this and that and, and then it just goes by the wayside. And there, how can we make them more uh, important in this process or, or more when when that previous slide and I, I can't go back to it, but it mentions that they have they host their budget. Uh, there it is. They host their budget public budget meetings. Yeah. How can how can we involve them more in this process and and just not a superficial you know thing, but to actually make them feel like they're part of this whole organization. Thank well, you. Sure. I, well, I guess what I'd say is this. At, I don't have a definitive answer for you, but I went to the Central Area Advisory Council a week and a half ago. No one from the public came. In general, and someone from my staff will go to each of them. Um, one of the community soups will be at that meeting and potentially some other staff. What I can tell you is it's, it's rarer than it's fairly rare that anyone from the public shows up. If they do show up, it might be one or two people tops. So I guess figuring out how to get the public engaged to give feedback would be the bigger question. But we, you know, we take notes from the meeting. Um, the community soups bring back any messages from the meeting. If there's something really material, you know, we, we take notes from the meeting and and you know, uh, they're available for Dr. Scrivens to see or Dr. Williams. Um, but what I, I, there's just not that much really that that's tangible out of those meetings. And again, I don't go to, I, I only go to maybe one a year and then all the different staff member go to one. You know, we just try to have someone from budget at each one. Um, so I, I don't have a great answer for you, but I, I think if they, wanted to give uh, feedback for the superintendent to hear. I, I think that's uh, very achievable through a lot of different avenues. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. And Mr. Taylor, if I have a follow up on that. Um, so I know that the, the only meeting that the area advisory councils um, is required to have is the annual budget meeting um, and according to their rules, but they collect feedback from the public year round mm -hmm. at all of their meetings. So they they may have had low attendance and you know, it's hard. I, I was chair of the Northeast Advisory. It's hard to get folks out, um, especially on weeknights. You're talking about working parents, you know, in a lot of cases and getting folks out is, you know, can be like pulling teeth sometimes. But when you do get folks out and they're providing feedback, say it's not on a budget night, those area advisory folks um, collect that feedback. They provide it to the board at least once a year, if not twice, and we get their wish lists. Um, when they meet with the board. Do you get a copy of those lists? And I know the superintendent does and the, the chiefs and um, community superintendents, executive directors get those. Is that information that you've received that can be used in the budget process? Because there's no shortage of, of requests. And I wanna make sure that those are that information is being funneled to you because they are providing it, just maybe sure. not in the budget meetings. Well, I guess what I'd say to that is no, I don't directly receive that. But if Dr. Williams receives it, then it's part of the budget process and he can put anything in the budget he, he'd like. You know what I mean? So if he's getting feedback that he feels important, he'll provide that feedback to us to make sure something's in the budget. Or when we have these meetings with the chiefs during the back and forth, they'll say, hey, I got this feedback. I'd really I'd like to see X, Y, or Z. So my receiving it, I don't, I don't put anything in the budget on my own other than the budget office. You know what I mean? We're sure. um, we're receiving requests from the chiefs and from from Dr. Williams. So if they're getting the message, then then that is the proper avenue to get it in. Sure. And the board giving feedback to Dr. Williams, he's certainly going to hear you. Yeah, and, and I appreciate Mr. McMillian asking this question because it feels we hear from the area advisories that they feel like it's a broken loop that the feedback they provide the board goes nowhere we hear it we provide it we often say where does the feedback we provide go and you say well if you say it you know it's the chiefs hear it you know the, the right people are hearing it but what assurance do we have that it's being used in this process and and this is very helpful thank you for this presentation because I've learned more in the last, you know, half hour than I have in five years on the board about this process. So this is just fantastic. Okay. Um, but I think yeah. what we need is some assurance that there's some type of um, process that takes this feedback, both ours and the area advisory councils, because they are advisors to the board, how we can provide that feedback in some controlled fashion and that it is used during the, um, budgeting process at whatever point it's most useful to you all. So I'll stop there and it sounds like some other board members have questions. Yes, Ms. Pasture and then Ms. Mack. Thank you. Uh, just in line with this, since Mr. Tantliff has said that maybe the recommendations go to the superintendent, I too would like <coughs> to uh, know possibly at the same time that it goes to the superintendent what some of those items or interest areas are. So maybe that is a function that can be put in that we get a copy or that the rep from that particular district gets a copy of whatever goes in that the superintendent says. Uh, because I hear things, but sometimes it's very general, sometimes it's specific, but we don't necessarily know what happens to it or have that kind of discussion. So, and sometimes it does miss us altogether. So we're hearing generalities. So maybe not necessarily connected with the budget office, but Ms. Hen through you uh, on your two levels uh, with the superintendent or each of us with our particular advisory groups can ask that whatever comes in, we get a copy of it. So we're always privy and aware of what their interests are. Thank you, Ms. Pester. Ms. Mack? 
Yes, thank you. And um, Mr. McMillian, thanks for asking that question because um, when Mr. Tantliff started, that was another question I wanted to ask, so I'm glad you brought it up. Um, Mr. Tantliff, I know we have um, work sessions where the public can come in and speak to the budget. Have we considered doing any type of survey to get the public's input on what they believe the new budget should include? Um, that has not come up. Okay. You mean like and then how about to, you mean which, SMAC, like okay. a survey that gets sent out from BCPS? Yes. Together, no. I mean, because one of the findings was that the like, just like the area advisory, the public sometimes does not feel heard and if if we see across all of our districts that there is a theme that you know regardless of where a parent or a caregiver is this particular issue is important i believe it would be one that we as a system would want to consider Ms. Um, Ann, this is george saris and you raise an excellent point um and we have uh, looked at Fairfax County and Montgomery County, who are the two largest leading systems uh, nearest us, and they do have an online uh, input mechanism to take uh, comments on the budget. And uh, this past year hasn't been the best for us in terms of new technology initiatives, but um, I think that's something that would address a lot of the board's concerns. I wouldn't want it to be viewed as um, diminishing the role of the advisory councils, but uh, that seems to be the, uh, the new way of the world. And of course, it's going to involve other departments than mine technology, perhaps research assessment and accountability who do a lot of the survey work. But I do think that's something that that we should pursue. OK, thank you. And then my other question is, unlike uh, other budget cycles, this is the first time that we have had an efficiency review that makes recommendations that are budget affecting and I'm just going to pull one out. Um, there is a recommendation that each school have a data analysis position. Uh, who takes that recommendation and puts it in his or her budget or does the superintendent look at the efficiency review decides what it will be included in this budget and does that once he gets it. Um, I'm particularly looking at anything that affects headcount, um, like the data position in each school. Can you tell me where in the process that would occur? Well, um, I think Dr. Williams announced and the meetings are about to kick off that he he's setting up a number of work groups yes. to look at the recommendations from the efficiency study. Um, and I'm, I don't know all the particulars of how the entire process will work because it's just kicking off. But, um, you know, my understanding would be at the end of this process, however long it takes, um, recommendations would come up that Dr. Williams, uh, you know, could then take and present to the board. Now, the timing may not work with the budget this year because... Right you know, quite frankly, the efficiency study was dropped at an arbitrary time, right? It was just when they were done with it. It wasn't done in time necessarily to incorporate in the budget process. And there's too much information in there uh, to go through it all. And I think, you know, when people go through it, there's going to be some stuff that makes sense and some stuff that really doesn't make sense, right? So um, how that finally gets incorporated into the budget, I can't tell you that for sure right now because the timing will be part of it. So it, for instance, I'm just making this up. Maybe it takes till February to get through the process or even March. Maybe um, then the superintendent would ask 
the county executive to incorporate some of those items, or maybe it would be in time for the board meeting. I, I don't have an exact answer for you on that, and it's really because of the timing and it matters the type of initiative. Um, certainly, if it's a reduction, um, take into account any people impact, you know, that's easier to do once the budget's set. We can always reduce the budget. Um, adding things uh, really can't be done unless we self fund it. So, I don't know, George, is there anything else you can add to well, that? Well, yeah, just the one point that doc, uh, Dr. Williams did ask us to uh, direct the chiefs as they develop their budget to align it with the findings of the report um, to the extent possible. And as Mr. Tantliff said, there are some, some unknowns because we're still uh, uh, meeting in these committees to discuss it. But uh, so that was made clear and, and I don't know, I haven't been to many of the meetings that we've had so far. Um, so I don't know to what extent any of the chiefs have been able to incorporate those recommendations, what you might know better. Yes, they're, yeah. They're, they're, yes, that's a good point. George. They did, there certainly are some things that are incorporated, but I think until we know for sure what the organization is going to accept, I think that was probably, you know, a struggle. So the consultants recommended it, but the chief may not necessarily know whether that is something that's going forward. So I think there were some things that they probably felt good about and they did put them in the budget. So there are uh, definitely line items in there that are attributable to the to the study. It's, you know, I, I don't, I couldn't give you a number off the top no, of my head. No, and I, I'm not holding uh, you to it. I know it was a hard question, so thank you. Um, just one more clarification. Under the advisory councils, is that just the geographic advisory councils or does that include the GTCAC and the um, CCAC? Well, right now, this is just talking about the area advisory councils. Um, I think the other councils, you know, have meetings with senior staff and with the superintendent at times and probably provide the feedback through that avenue. But um, I, I've only been involved with the area advisory councils in, in terms of the budget. I just bring that up because many times in those meetings, the, ne the need for additional staff comes up. And I, I would hope that that is being heard and of course there are many bcps staff on this call so i hope it comes back through that channel but i just wanted to ask that question thank you for all of those answers well special ed definitely knows they need positions and they pretty much ask for them every year the the problem is it's just very difficult to match the staffing to the needs it's you know just such a heavy lift um, thank you, Ms. Mack, and thank you, Mr. Tantliff. Um, before we continue, um, I move that the committee recommend to the full board asking Dr. Williams to implement an online survey to collect public input on the fiscal year 2024 budget modeled on the Fairfax and Montgomery County instruments. May I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Ms. Bean, may I have a roll call vote, please? Yes, uh, Ms. Jose, not absent. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Okay. Thank we you, have, Ms. Bean. Yep. The motion carries. I will um, make that recommendation during the next full board update as an update from the committee. Thank you all. Yeah. And back to you, Mr. Tantliff. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Um, here, just to refresh everyone's memory, here's the size of this year's budget, 2.3 billion. Um, and here are the big uh, buckets. And just a reminder, there's the general fund, which is uh, what at the budget hearing is what gets 
the primary discussion and of course the capital projects get their own discussions during the capital meetings, uh, special revenue grants, which normally don't get you know, all that much discussion, but of course with ESSER right now, there's been a lot of conversation. Enterprise fund is food service. Debt service is county debt issuance dedicated to school construction. We carry those amounts on our uh, books, but we don't, um, we have no ability to issue the debt. We're just required to reflect how much is out there. Um, and then internal service covers our workers' compensation. Um, and this is really just how I set the stage for the budget managers when we get together. Um, everyone here may have heard in the news last week, the state ended up with a $2.5 billion record surplus. So uh, just a tremendous amount of money and things are a lot different than than I think a lot of people envisioned a year earlier. Um, tax revenue didn't fall off, it grew. Um, and at the same time, a bunch of stimulus money came in that, you know, it's fungible. So even if it was restricted, it's money that might have been spent with the general fund and got replaced with stimulus. So in any case, the governor's sitting on a two and a half billion dollar surplus, and there have been some articles on how they may spend the money. Um, the one thing I've heard several times in the news is uh, police and adding um, enhancement to different police forces. So, um, you know, things could change. Delta's uh, got a downward trend, but as we know, things could change and things could tighten up again. Uh, the blueprint, I think everyone here knows it was vetoed, but overridden in the last session. The bill forces increase in state and local funding for education, but it also drives a significant increase in mandates and expenditures. Um, state revenue was flat in FY22 to FY21. It would have dropped by 31 million, if you recall, due to our enrollment drop, but the legislature enacted and the governor agreed to a hold harmless provision. So basically our state revenue was flat to the prior year last year. Um, I think I talk about it a tad on the, on the next slide, but enrollment is really the wild card again. We had been projecting that it would bounce back, but right now it looks like uh, enrollment, I'm not sure exactly where it's gonna fall, but it's in the same neighborhood as year ago. Um, maybe a little higher than last year, but not nearly uh, to where we were in September of 2019. We have a bi-weekly call with MSDE and uh, George actually asked if the other counties, what they were seeing and everyone who spoke up, which was quite a number, they pretty much uh, said the same thing. They did not see their enrollment bounce back as much as they had hoped to. Um, I haven't really seen that in the paper, you know, because I guess it's not a drop anymore. It's kind of flat to a small increase, but that that's a wild card in all the funding. So Blueprint could still drive an increase in state revenue, but much less than it would have been if, rev, if um, enrollment didn't drop. So in other words, you have the Blueprint formula going up offset by the drop in enrollment. Uh, you know, how long it takes for the whole situation to stabilize. I think that's anyone's guess, and I don't know any more about it than anyone else. But, you know, hopefully if we can keep the kids in school all year, a lot of the parents of the young kids where we saw the fall off will feel good about and confident about returning to public education, whereas they might have felt more confident at private schools or just kept the kids at home because the drop off is all at the elementary level. We still are seeing at least modest growth uh, versus 2019 in middle and high school. Um, the county funded about three and a half percent above maintenance of effort last year. And that was really just enough for us to um, fund a mid-year COLA January 1st and step increases for our bargaining units um, and I think as we've talked to uh, many times at the board meeting and we've discussed here, 
The three tranches of the ESSER funding will produce almost $360 million through FY24. However, usage is highly restricted. And so, um, you know, there's different ways to use the money, but it's not in any way that we'd like. Um, and then just as a refresher, maintenance of oh, effort. Pardon me, Mr. Tantliff. I believe sure. Ms. Mack had a question. Uh, sure. And I just let me know because I can't see any hands with the presentation. Sure. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Mack. Mr. Tantliff, I appreciate the conversation about um, the enrollment. What is what by what date do we provide the enrollment that determines our funding for the next year? Sure. So it's our enrollment as of September 30th, but it takes about six weeks to get all the data cleaned up and submitted to MSDE. So I believe, I don't know the exact date, but usually by mid-November, um, we, we state what our official enrollment is and MSDE accepts it. And they, they have some back and forth too. So they may take, they'll receive our number, they may disqualify 50 kids or something for one reason or another. But it's generally mid-November, and then as a reminder, our enrollment this year drives our revenue next year. Right, and I, I'm sorry, I now see this slide, but my next question is, when, when you talk about the 359 million in ESSER funds, in the previous slide where you showed the budget categories, can you tell me where that 359 million would be? Uh, well, it's in special revenue because it's a grant, but remember the 359 um, occurred in FY21, 22, 23, and 24. So There's this reflects the then. amount of it that was in this year. We have roughly a third of ESSER three in this year's budget. And when we built this year's budget, we didn't know how we'd spend it. We just sort of knew the totals. Um, so next year's budget, we have a, a more accurate read of how much of ESSER three, for instance, will be in the budget because we now ha have a budget. We're still waiting for the approval from MSDE, but we know what we submitted. We should hopefully hear within a week or two that what we submitted is approved. Um, there may be some amendments uh, that come up over time. So uh, that that explains why you wouldn't see that whole amount in one year. But it is safe to say that after 2024, we're that special revenue fund is going to appear to be much lower because it's not going to have any portion of the ESSER funds. Is that correct? Uh, correct if nothing changes. Um, you know, for instance, so ESSER 3 is 22, 3, and 4. But um, maybe a lot of districts across the country will have trouble getting it all spent by then, and Congress will allow it to be spent an extra year. I'm, I'm just making that up. Okay, no, okay. So I, that's what I'm trying to make sense in. of. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So normally our special revenue would be like 80 or 90 million. In a okay, that's that's kind of pandemic. where I was going. Thank you very much. Okay. Maintenance of effort is um, what we call the funding from the county. Uh, and basically it's how much did you spend per child last year times this year's enrollment. Now, the blueprint legislation, uh, so the original blueprint legislation is generally referred to by the House bill, which is 1300, um, but then the, and that's about 300 pages. The amended bill after overriding the governor's veto is HB 1372, and that's a much more modest 70-page uh, addendum, so it supersedes a number of the items because it's a year later and there's more information available. Uh, so we're hoping that they come out like with something that combines everything. So you kind of have to still go between bills to figure out and try to interpret things. Um, but in any case, as part of 1372, the bill from last year, uh, they 
added the state hold harmless. And to make it simple, they required the county funding to also stay flat to the prior year if they wanted to get the state match. So the county's funding could have dropped. Now they also redefined which years to use for MOE. So it wouldn't have, uh, whereas in the past it matches the current year's enrollment, it would have had to have been an average of three years. But um, they required this, the, the county to basically match what we had gotten in FY21 in order for us to get the $30 million and then the county um, provided a little above that. But that's basically how uh, the county's minimum legal requirement is defined. So in a simple world, if your enrollment was flat, the county's requirement would be to, to provide the same funding as the prior year. Um, and of course, we work with the county and that, since the state funding is the state funding, it's by formula and it is what it is. Once we take that into account, the only way to pay for new initiatives that the board and the superintendent desire is to get additional funding from the county. There's just, that's why we, you know, at the board meeting, when you guys are adding things, we always talk about, you know, the county funding this or that. Um, and that's why it's because we can't ask the state for extra funding. That's, that's coming in by statute. Um, and, uh, Ms. Nen, I have a question for Mr. Tantler. Thank yeah, you. Yes, yes, Mr. McMillian. Go ahead. Mr. Tantler, early in our process, are we getting receiving information from the county executive's physical team to let us know, you know, what we what we have to work with, or if there's any play there, or we're going to be? It it just seems to me it would be much more efficient if we knew going into the process a, a close proximity of the amount of money that we have to work with, rather than waste, you know, construct something and then have to go back and say, well, we have less money to work with, we have more money to work with. Thank you. Um, yes, George and I would wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. Um, the, generally, the county historically might give us some clues, but they they will not. And, and honestly, they couldn't make a firm number um, by December when we'd need it. And the reason is this. They're going through a process now, too, and their process is later than ours because it culminates in April, whereas ours culminates, you know, in January or February. So the, the county executive isn't going to know all of his revenue streams yet. And he's still formulating what he wants to fund on the county government side. What new things does he need for, you know, uh, whatever things that he's focusing on. So he's still working on revenue, although they might have a feel for what they're going to be sitting on. Um, the, the, they might, again, open up the lid a little and, you know, historically Brian or Kevin before him um, and George and the superintendents, when they have meetings with their peers, um, you know, we'll try to get any information we can, um, but it's hard to get definitive feedback uh, on our timeline. And so normally, uh, we're asking for a certain amount above maintenance of effort. And so in the end, we can if the county can't fund that, we can hopefully work with them um, so the superintendent can prioritize what does have to be reduced. Now the CE adds things on his own sometimes also that we may not have asked for, but he may feel that we need. So. Uh, yes, it's an imperfect process. And even, especially this year with the state funding, we don't get preliminary state funding until uh, mid to late January. But this year, everyone's still interpreting the legislation. Um, so there could be a little more volatility than normal um, because we have pretty good models that we've built over time to project how much state revenue will be but we're having to rebuild them all now to take into account the new formulas and some aspects of the formula, like any complex piece of legislation, it made sense to someone who wrote it down, but it doesn't necessarily lend itself to easy interpretation in terms of execution and what it means. 
and that's true for MSDE and all the other LEAs. We're trying to figure all of this um, out. So we could see more volatility than is typical on that side also. Mr. Tatliff, thank you. And that makes sense to me about the county executive not having all his, you know, revenue and the fact that his his budget's behind us and he doesn't know all his revenue so as, as it's coming in for us. So that makes sense to me. Thank you. Sure. And he doesn't know what's going to come up, so he wants to hold his cards close to his vest too because he doesn't know something big might come up, either a calamity or just something that he wants to fund. And especially now with COVID, things change so dramatically almost week to week. Um, there could be a big new expense that comes up. So he wants to kind of keep his powder dry as long as he can, I think. Um, okay, and then uh, just the last thing here, we talked about enrollment. Um, but it could easily be that the new formula is uh, overwhelms the loss in enrollment, but the increase is much less than it would have been. So um, someone made the point on our biweekly MSDE call, not that anyone's considering this, but, but whereas Hold Harmless last year was keeping our dollars flat to the prior year, with Blueprint, it still might go up because the formula is enhanced, but to to implement what the legislature's intent would be, you'd have to almost keep the enrollment hold harmless, so to speak. So uh, in other words, make believe your enrollment's a few thousand higher to what it was in 2019 and um, you know, then see what the formula comes up with. That's highly unlikely to happen. Um, and the one other caveat I would just mention of interest is in the blueprint legislation, and you know, Ms. Pasteur is very familiar with this, they projected how much it would cost the county and the state and all the out years to hit the different goals and um, requirements of blueprint. They, they didn't take into account that enrollment would drop during the pandemic, which they couldn't have. And last year in the, when they amended the budget, they kind of ignored that and assumed we'd get back on a glide path. So that, you know, has kind of unknown consequences because of enrollments lower, um, our revenues at a lower level, but uh, that may make a lot of the assumption in the blueprint legislation be understated in terms of cost. Uh, so we'll see. It could get amended. It might not. Um, we'll know a lot more, I think, over the coming months in that regard. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, priorities. You know, there's uh, there's certainly the the efficiency study, and there are initiatives to support that. Um, we know uh, ESOL and special ed for, we just not been able to catch up. Um, but one thing that sort of ended up being nice is we were able to do some things with the ESSER grants um, that help close the COVID learning gap that we wouldn't have been able to do in the general fund. And a, an example right here um, is we requested secondary IEP chairs, dedicated IEP chairs um, where right now it's a special ed teacher is the IEP chair. By having a dedicated IEP chair, now you free up a special ed teacher and we can see if a dedicated IEP chair um, sort of pays for itself, so to speak, in terms of IEPs not being missed, being more solid, um, not lawsuits, you know, less lawsuits threatening to sue us and that sort of thing. So that's kind of a, a small bright side on the um, ESSER initiative. Um, and, you know, initiatives should align with the efficiency study. George mentioned about that. Uh, and the superintendent also mentioned, be ready. Um, you might have a good initiative that he supports, but be ready to make it into a multi-year initiative if there's not enough uh, funding to support it this year. And then this, these are, uh, well, any questions before I go on? Um, so this is kind of the page. Uh, the, I just have a couple pages in here that just show 
um, part of what we give to the budget managers to kick things off. So their budget target or their baseline budget is called a mark. Um, and we talked about this already. So managers have to review and assess the budget before delegating to support staff. So in other words, um, they really need to understand what's being submitted. Um, and then the rest is just kind of technical. Do you have your dollars in the right place? Is it the right string? And uh, something we talk about a lot in terms of the bat is the county approves the budget by activity, which is the legal requirement. Uh, and then here's the built-ins, and we talked about this. Um, we really want to see as much detail as possible. You know, no one can just make something into a built-in. It ultimately needs to get approved by George. And you know, we just apply kind of a common sense test to it and see if it makes sense. And then we look for as much detail as they can possibly um, provide so that we feel good about what they're asking for. Um, a redirect means um, you want to take money you have and put it somewhere else in your budget at the same amount, at the same dollar amount. Um, it's it's a fairly minimal amount. Um, we that do, the board does approve the redirects, and for the most part, it's um, you might have a couple of FTEs created using contractual dollars. You might just have to move money to a new activity. Um, you might um, move stuff between departments. Um, it's kind of that sort of thing. It's There's not a ton of that, but that is part of uh, the budget process. And as I mentioned, um, if some FTEs are created, we'll certainly present them to you, but that's not um, a big part of the equation. And an A4, uh, just for your detailed information, that is what the form is called to request a new initiative. So Mr. Tantliff, the redirects you're referring to um, that come to the board are part of the BAT. Would those well, be rolled up? Here, these are different redirects. Different these redirects. are asking to start the budget the next year at a different place. So you would just, okay. so, so in other words, you're receiving where they've moved the money to and you're seeing where they moved it from, but that's not anything to do with this year's budget, it's next year's budget. But it's the same concept as a bat. A bat is people throughout the year, offices have to do a budget line transfer, and when it changes activities, we need to request um, permission from the board to ultimately move money between activities and then ultimately get that approved by the council. But it's a much smaller part of the um, adopted budget process, but you're seeing, you're approving the starting point. The starting point is what leads to the back between the starting point and where we end up in the operate, in the actual budget is the bat. So it's, ex it's expenditures versus budgeted funds really, the starting point versus the ending point? Uh, yes, yes, you could. I mean, the bat though is actually, you're you're approving a change in the budget, but it's driven by the actual, so that's right. correct. Okay, thank you. And, and when you said that it was um, multiple items, I was thinking of the bat, but they generally roll up to the categories that we see, which are not um, department level line items, so. Generally, right. we don't see the details of those. Right. Okay. So we'll show you next month. Um, we'll have um, an actual, it's a prototype. Uh, it'll have actual data from this year, but mm -hmm. we'll show you what we're proposing to give to budget committee to sort of build to the bat. So we're gonna, we're gonna give you a roll up of um, year to date office requests that move dollars from one activity to another and why. So hopefully right. that'll give you a feel. Then we'll at least get one more quarter's worth before the bat. Mm -hmm. um, but the pro, you know, we need to close the period and then there needs to be a time, there's a time lag till you see it. Um, so it's not gonna be up to the second. So when you get the bat, you won't, you know, there'll be a little time lag there that we won't have presented everything to you. Okay, so we, we approve the overall budget. Um, 
Are you saying we generally get the detail of the redirects from year to year? Because I don't think we approve them separately. But are you saying we approve that when we approve the well, overall budget? Well, yes. And so there's two things. When when an office builds their baseline budget, they're not restricted in where they plan those dollars. So if their budget was 32,000 and it was all in you know activity one and two that there's nothing to prevent them from putting some money in activity three and so when you get the budget you're getting the roll up of what everyone submitted and that's our new starting point the redirects for the budget for the most part are when dollars are moving between offices or when we're creating an fte so if you uh, yeah so that that's the short story it's a fairly limited um, number of items but in the end it's all getting incorporated into the budget you adopt miss Ann, this is george saris again hi hi there is a paragraph or two or three depending yeah. on the activity in the budget document mm -hmm. that summar <clears throat> summarizes the programmatic redirects so that uh, everybody knows if we've discontinued a program and put that money into a different initiative um, so that the board does receive that in the budget document. But I, we're also talking about transfers that are proposed after the budget's adopted and uh, adjustments that the chiefs make while they're building their budget, which you wouldn't necessarily see at that detailed level, uh, but the programmatic things you do see in that section of the document. OK, thank you, George. That helps. I, I was thrown by the approvals. I'm like, I don't think we approve those separately, and that can happen anytime during the year. And Right. Can those move anywhere within across categories or only within the um are you are you talking about categories? for the bat during the year? For the um redirects during the year. Um well the redirects were year were part of the but we're talking about the budget process. We're not at all talk we're talking about building the adopted budget. We're not talking at all about the in-year operating budget so correct yeah so just to keep those things separate but we we allow them to move um when they do a blt during the year which you'll ultimately approve the aggregate change in activity um now it has to make sense of course but generally there's not going to be a restriction if they during the year wanted to move money from one office to another, we would allow them to do that. And if they're trying to do something and they need to move money between activities, we allow them to do that. And then it rolls up into the bat that you vote on. OK, food and nutrition. I'll, I'll pick on them for a minute because they're completely separate. Could would there be a trans? Would that be allowed? For money, would let's say, from the office of the superintendent to move into office of food and nutrition since they're completely separate well not normally because food okay. and nutrition is an enterprise fund that's self-sufficient right. correct so now you may recall we did request uh because the cep was under was was not self-sustaining uh we did budget for the county to fund part of cep mm -hmm. um and then we were able to cover it in the esser grant but then uh, under the um, American Relief Program, all food for all children is free across the country this year. So we didn't need to actually fund that through um, uh, through the ESSER fund. But if you went back to um, CEP is several million to do it, depending on how wide you do it, it can be several million dollars underwater. And so there's no way for food nutrition to sustain that. So money would probably have to come in from an outside source to keep them in balance. Okay. 
Thank you. But that's just normally we're just giving them a, a one time boost in revenue. So from wherever it's coming from, it would need it really needs to be an extra source of revenue from the county. There's not real or grants in this case. There's no other practical way really to do that. OK, thank you. Sure. Ms. Hen, I've got a question. Mr. Yes, Blaine. Mr. McMillian, go ahead. Mr. Tanner, <laughs> I, I said a month or so ago, I'm becoming more and more uh, cynical all the time. And I've, and I've had people tell me that they don't have money for, like, give an example, grounds people don't have money for a particular piece of equipment. And when they ask for it, they're told that there's no money for it. Uh, and these are people out doing a job every day that, and what's happening is they're sharing this particular piece of equipment and I could find out the name of it between X number of schools and areas and stuff. And, and so the workers are not, or, or, or feel like they're not getting the equipment they need to do the job efficiently. And then I'm aware of a situation at, at Chesapeake, we were told numerous years are, and, and I understand that this is probably different money, but I think it, I can use it as an example that there were, that for a number of years, they told us our out, uh, outdoor surface area was going to be, it was in the budget, it was going to be restored, it was going to be uh, uh, reconstructed or whatever. And every, for a number of years in the spring, they come back to us and say, sorry, you know, that money was redirected, you know, the money's, in, and I often wonder, and so then finally when I got on the board, yeah, that, that outdoor surface court got fixed and it's really, really nice. But is there a slim possibility that some department heads are just saying to people, okay, we've got this much money, but we're not going to spend this much money because we're going to redirect it someplace at the end? And I know that that's cynical, but I, it's just something that it's on my mind. Thank you. Um, so, of course, without knowing a specific situation, there'd be no way to address it because, as you know, it often happens, especially when you get down to a maintenance worker. Um, they may interpret, they may hear, they may not really understand what the full story is. Um, but if you're in facilities, your money's all staying within facilities. Um, they're repairing equipment as much as they can. Uh, I, I think there's probably, you know, maybe misinterpretations or a manager, a supervisor talking to a frontline worker and that conversation either is incorrect or gets misinterpreted, but they would not be um, trying not to spend their money. They would be trying to, to execute all the maintenance and all the groundskeeping that they're tasked with, and they'll repair stuff as much as they can. And, and quite honestly, if there was a situation where, uh, you know, they ran out of money and we couldn't maintain I mean, it's preposterous, but we couldn't, you know, fix our lawnmowers. We would find them that that request would find its way up through my office and then to George. Um, and depending on how much money it is, we would we would find a solve for that problem. So I don't think the situation you described, uh, I'm sure it, it got communicated to you that way, but I don't think it's it's really not happening in that way. You know, it's. It's just all, you know, you have 10,000 points of contact and, you know, one interaction results in an incorrect story or the person might have, under, you know, the person might have, uh, the supervisor might tell them a, not understand and give them the wrong information, you know. Okay, thank you for walking me through that. Thank you. Sure, but again, without knowing an exact situation, it's hearsay. You know what I mean? Because if we knew the exact situation, then we could all go look into it and see see what's what and why it you know was why it was talked about that way. Thanks again. Sure. Uh, you've seen this uh, chart before, but just to emphasize, enrollment is everything, and we dropped by four thousand last year, which was five thousand below projections. Our projections for this September is 16188 that's what we've told the world um but it looks like we're not going to come in much above last year and that's probably 
a similar story across most LEAs, and I'm guessing across the country, because uh, I don't think there's anything different about Baltimore County in that regard, but I'm sure over the next, the coming months, we'll hear more about that. Um, then I'm just going to tell you really uh, briefly about how the school budgets refresh your memory on how those are built and then then answer the question about year end money. Um, so this is how the schools get their operating budget. It's a per pupil allocation times their total number of kids. Um, they get extra money. The special ed supplement is for uh, children they have in self contained classrooms. So it's not every child on an IEP. Um, and so we take these amounts. Here's the baseline amount on top. Here's uh, the special ed supplement. And you add it all together and you get an operating budget. Um, now, they Excuse are- me, Mr. Tantliff. Um, Ms. Hen, I do have a question about that previous slide. Sure. Um, I think it's worth noting, and I've spoken to this every year since I've been on the board, that those numbers um, represent up to a 40% decrease in what schools were previously budgeted. Um, I'm looking for my budget book right now, and it's not handy, but um, I think the 83 was 105, the 100, um, the, the 89 was 115 and the high school was like 100 and actually it was even more than that. I mean, it was a pretty significant cut. And just like Mr. Um, McMillian said that he hears a lot about, you know, various problems in the community. This is the one of the biggest frustrations that I hear at the school level that their schoolhouse budget has been cut so dramatically and not been increased. Um, I believe Dr. Williams proposed, I want to say a $2 per pupil increase in the last budget and it did not pass the county. Um, so from my data show that since the implementation of the STAT program, schools have lived with this significant cut in their pu per pupil spending. Is there any discussion about changing that? Um, let's see a couple things. So last year, and I believe Ms. Hen proposed a significant increase in the per I pupil did. funding, and that that did not make it past the CE. The year before, we did put a couple percent inflation on the per pupil, and that did go through. Um, so what, one thing I would say, Ms. Mack, and I know we've supplied documents to the board over the years. I, I can't speak to every school, but in aggregate, school spending power has been held harmless because there's lots of things they used to spend themselves that is all funded centrally now. So they used to buy their own devices. That's all done centrally now. They used to do all their copiers. That's all done centrally now. So there's there's a lot of things and we have um, we have a document um, you know, and the board can request that again during the budget process, but we kind of showed exactly what got pulled out each year and why. Now, you have to make macro assumptions. So if there was a school that never, ever bought a device, they probably do have less spending power, right? Because they weren't spending their money on devices. Um, but now, of course, you can look at how much the device program got expanded, especially with COVID. Um, now, no one would expect the schools to pay for that. But um, when you go through all of it, there's a lot of items that are centrally paid for now that they used to not pay for. It's not true of every school because every school got, you know, if they're elementary, they all got money taken out of their budget when we rolled out devices to elementary schools, same thing with middle and high schools, et cetera. So it's every single school can't be exactly held harmless, but in aggregate they were. So that's not to say there's not certain situations, but you know, I just want to mention you, 
if you just look at the per pupil, it's not at all a fair apples to apples comparison. Can I just clarify? Because I found my book and I found my slide. I I way underestimated what it used to understated what it used to be. And FY14, elementary schools were at 142, middle schools were at 157, and high schools were at 186. Um, so I do understand what you're saying um, about the centralized printing and things like that, but those are pretty significant cuts. 43% in elementary school, 45% in middle, and 42 in high. Um, I, again, I, I appreciate your input. I'm just putting it out there that I, I think it's something we need to look at. Thank you. And, and no response is needed. No, I understand. I totally understand. You know, any money we can get in the schools. Um, I, I don't know that the schools are not receiving enough funding. I'm sure there's certain principals that would love to have more money. Um, but at the same time, it seems like this in aggregate and you're always going to hear from the schools that feel like they don't have enough money. Um, but you know, from where I'm sitting and the feedback I hear, I, I don't constantly hear that they can't fund this or that. But, you know, they could just not be talking and they might just have, you know, maybe they're just accepting where they are and dealing with it as best they can. But I totally hear what you're saying. And could, could I add something that sure. may be a bright spot? Um, one of the, uh, you know, we, clearly heard the board's proposal. Uh, Dr. Williams hears it from principals, and I think it's particularly an issue in less affluent communities that don't have the fundraising capabilities. So one uh, feature that we've built into the ESSER 3 grant was about 3.1 or 3.2 million um, uh, for which schools principals can submit proposals um, to conduct their own initiatives that meet the needs of their schools and their communities. So um, we felt like that was one way we could try to address needs at the school level. Thanks, George. I yeah. wasn't aware of that, but thank you for letting us know that. And sure. so is it just certain schools would be able to do that or yeah. any school could no, submit a proposal? It's any school and uh, they have three years to do it. So that's uh, good to know. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Harris. And thank you, Ms. Mack, for raising this. Um, and I'm glad you you had the numbers for 2014 because that was prior to um, STAT and the rollout of the device initiatives. I've had the conversation with a middle school and a high school, which um, principals, which have shared similar numbers. And I distinctly remember the conversation with a high school um, and the numbers are in align with what were shared with me, which was a 50% reduction. Um, in this administrator's per pupil um, allocation and the the central allocation you know that that this person um, referenced had to do with copiers and it was it did not offset that reduction in the school's allocation so it it hurt this school considerably and my motion um, to increase the per pupil allocation was driven by that feedback that that we really do need, that the board needs to restore or try to make whole um, this. What would be helpful, um, Mr. Tantliff, and you mentioned there is a document that could possibly be shared with the board, would be to under have a better understanding of what those centralized um, expenses are that, that we cover for schools versus what schools are expected to um, cover themselves. Some of the types of expenses that I've that schools have shared with me that they're struggling with are um, supplies to support their arts programs, um, both in terms of musical instruments, art supplies. Some of our magnet programs are asking for help. 
Um, these are supplies that are quite expensive um, that parents cannot always afford the bur burden of, um, nor should be asked to, and that um, Central has not been able to provide adequate supplies for, especially in some of our more overcrowded schools where our supplies may not be able to meet demands. We have schools with instruments that um, date back decades that are in such poor um, shape that they are barely usable. And um, the school budgets do not support replacement um, and and school administrators can't just can't afford to replace them themselves. So I'm curious to know if those are um, expenses that we should be covering for them or that we need to um, boost the per pupil allocations so that schools can purchase them themselves. We've got amazing fine arts programs. Um, <coughs> I think it's a sin that we can't provide students with the supplies that they need, the instruments that they need to be able to flourish because there's no shortage of talent in the system. We need to be, be able to provide these students instruments and art supplies that they need. So. I, I want to be able to, um, as we go into the budget season, to be able to make intelligent motions to to make sure that our budget includes adequate supplies, um, either at the school level or through central office to be able to provide our students those. So thank you, Ms. Mack, for raising um, that question. And Mr. Tantliff, whatever information the board can be provided in terms of what um, schools are expected to provide versus what central office is expected to provide, that would be um, very helpful. OK, um, and on the music, uh, we'd have to check with the office executive, but I know they have a large instrument repair budget, so I think they handle system wide repairs. Um, but I haven't had a conversation lately that I can think of in terms of who's how do instruments get replaced? Um, when would a school pay for it versus the music office? So that we'd have to find out for you. That'd be great. Some some have aged beyond repair. I, I've seen them personally, so I'm yeah. I'm curious to know what our our replacement budget would be as well as repair. So, um, board um, members, any other questions? And I'll I'll hand it back to Mr. Tantliff. And thank you for your patience with our questions. Sure, I appreciate it. OK, hearing none. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and then so the school budgets are developed independently based on the formula I just showed you, and it's it it doesn't matter if they have money left at year end. They're not going to be penalized for that or have that taken away from their budget. We actually I have a resource dedicated to helping the schools look at their budget and make sure they're spending their budget. We don't want them to go over budget, but we do want them to spend their budget. Um, and before we put this resource on, um, a lot of schools had been underspending their budget. Um, but it's now last year, a lot of schools underspent their budget just because of COVID and no one was in school. That was, you know, uh, unprecedented situation. But we're looking at their spending every month. Um, and Michael, who's on my team, uh, is meeting with schools every day and uh, he'll meet with us each month. We'll look at the expenditures and the run rate and we'll try to look, for, OK, are there some schools that look like they're not on track? And then he'll reach out to the school because, you know, it's one person. He can't regularly be talking to all 175 schools, but he'll get with that the principal and their fiscal assistant. And, and you know, make sure that everyone's on track, make sure they know all their spending deadlines, et cetera. So we do not encourage the schools to underspend their budget. We want them to spend all the money that they have, and we work very hard to do that. So I think that was Mr. McMillian's question. They are not penalized. And uh, really the central offices aren't penalized either because their budgets are built for the following year. Uh, you know, really it's submitted in January, so that's well before um, their spending for the year is complete. So uh, no, no one is penalized for that. We are not the federal government. We're not revisiting my Navy days where we'd buy $5,000 of rags in my division on my ship 
so that it wouldn't get cut from our budget the next year. So we try not to operate that way. And here's the school budget timeline, uh, which is just a tad different. Um, they get their budgets once, the, you know, when we're, we're sure what the CE is going to present. So they'll put their budgets in in April. They spend in July and we give them 85% of their projected budget. So in other words, um, if they if they were projected to have a thousand kids, we'll fund 850 of them in April. And then in November, once the enrollment's final, we'll push out the remaining dollars. So they might, if they ended up with 1,100 kids, then we'll fund them up to 1,100. If it ended up being 950, we'll fund them up to 950. So we give them plenty of money to start the year, um, but we don't want, you know, there's no way to accurately project every school's one year enrollment. So that's why we only give them 85% uh, to begin the year. In November, we push out sub funds, short term subs to secondary schools. Um, and then in December, uh, you know, I said we, we finalize those holdback dollars in November. Then in December, we open up the system for the schools to put the remaining 15% into the budget. Um, they spend and in March they start hitting all their year-end spending deadlines and then in June 30th the year ends and the unspent funds go into our fund balance that the county government controls and this just talks about principals staying on top of their spending this is just a sheet when we train the principals that it's just one page that we talk to them you know keep on top of it meet as often as you can, at least a couple times a month if possible with your fiscal or admin secretary and look look where your spending is. We've rolled out really good models to all the schools to help them track their spending. And we're sending spending reports out to the schools now because they uh, don't yet have access to Advantage Financial. Um, hopefully they will in the not too distant future, but, but users are still limited as we're bouncing back from uh, the ransomware attack. And that was kind of um, everything I had to present to the committee today. Ms. Hen, I have one question. Yes, Mr. McMillian. Mr. Tantliff, at one time, if I'm not mistaken, in the, in the recent past, that any money that wasn't used for substitutes during the year then it was at the discretion of the principal to spend that however they chose to. Is that accurate? Um, that's slightly accurate. Uh, so what we've done in years past is if schools, this is just secondary schools because elementary schools don't get a sub budget, all their sub expenses go centrally. And uh, the reason for that is secondary schools have have uh, the ability using department heads, et cetera, to cover um, some substitute situations. And I know this year's kind of crazy with substitutes. But what we'll do is we'll look at schools that have been especially good at underspending their budget. Um, we'll present that to the superintendent and then he or she, depending on the year, um, normally they agree with our recommendation. So there might be 15 schools that have significantly underspent their budget and we'll let them now take that money. Let's just say it's $10,000. We'll let them take that into their operating budget and spend it. Now we have to do that in February. So, you know, they could have a big shoot up in their sub uh, spending and not end up where we think, but you got to draw a line in the sand somewhere. Um, so, you know, that's what we've done in the past. Last year, we obviously didn't do it because it was not a normal year for subs. Um, and this year remains to be seen whether we'll do it because, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, with subs and it's, you know, an anomaly year and it might not be practical to do that. Thanks again for dealing with all my questions, Mr. Tantler. Thank you. Happy to. Thank you Happy. very, very much. This yes. was wonderful. Thank you, Mr. McMillian, for your question. Thank you, Ms. Matt. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. And most of all, thank you very much, Mr. Tantler.
this was an outstanding presentation. I know I learned a lot. This was incredibly, incredibly helpful and valuable. Good. Well, it's a good use of all our time. If um, Mr. Sarris, thank you as well. If you're still with us. Ways. Very much so. Thank you. All right, then. Any further, uh -huh. if there were any further questions from any committee members before we move on to the next agenda item, which we covered somewhat, but we have one other item before we adjourn. Ms. Pester? No, I just want to thank you. This really was um, informative. The It was just very informative. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mack? Mr. McMillian? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda was a discussion of committee collection and inclusion of full board input for future budget work sessions. If there were any ideas or motions from the committee in terms of providing additional input, um, or we could move, to, we could table this item to the next board committee meeting. I would um, entertain that motion as well. I move to table this item to the next meeting. No, I Is second. there a second? Yeah, Thank I you, second. Mr. McMillian. Ms. Bean, may I have a roll call vote, please, to table the motion, the next agenda item to the next committee meeting? Yes, Ms. Mack. Yes. Mr. McMillian. Yes, please. Ms. Pasture. Yes. Ms. Hen. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. That agenda item is tabled to the next committee meeting. And with that, there is no um, further items of business. The next meeting of the Budget Committee will be on November 17th, 2021. Because there is no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful Thanks evening. Again. Good evening. Take care. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Take care. Good night,